Shirley by Charlotte Bronte. Of late years, an abundant shower of curates has fallen upon the north of England. They lie very thick on the hills, every parish has one or more, and they ought to be doing a great deal of good. But not of late years are we about to speak. We are going back to the beginning of this century. Although that affluent rain had not descended and curates were scarce in the west riding of Yorkshire, in the year of 1811-12, three sat together at dinner. Allow me to introduce Mr. Dunn, curate of Winbury, Mr. Malone, curate of Briarfield, Mr. Sweeting, curate of Nunley. They are at Mr. Dunn's lodgings, being the habitation of one John Gale, a small clothier. Mrs. Gale waits on them, but a spark of the hot kitchen fire is in her eye. "'More bread!' cries Mr. Malone, in a tone which, though prolonged but to utter two syllables, proclaims him at once a native of the land of shamrock and potatoes. Mrs. Gale offered the loaf. "'Cut it, woman!' said her guest, and the woman cut it accordingly. Had she followed her inclination, she would have cut the parson also. Her Yorkshire soul revolted absolutely from his manner of command." As they sat thus and sipped their wine, a foot was heard on the outer doorstep, and the knocker quivered to a sharp appeal. Mr. Gale went and opened. "'Whom have you upstairs in the parlour? asked a voice. "'Oh, Mr. Hellstone, is it you, sir? I could hardly see you for the darkness. Will you walk in, sir?' With these words a person entered. A middle-aged man in black, short of stature, but straight of port, and bearing on broad shoulders a hawk's head, beak, and eye— the whole surrounded by a shovel hat, which he did not seem to think it necessary to remove before the presence in which he stood. What? he began with the air of a veteran officer chiding his subalterns. I find you gentlemen tarrying over your cheap wine and scolding like angry old women. And he began to rebuke the three young curates for drinking while their counterparts were out preaching. I came to see Malone, he continued. I have an errand unto thee, O captain. What is it? inquired Malone discontentedly. There can be no funeral to take at this time of day. Have you arms about you? Arms, sir. Yes, and legs. And he advanced the mighty members. Bah! Weapons, I mean. I have the pistols you gave me yourself. I never part with them. I lay them ready cocked on the chair by my bedside at night. Very good. Will you go to Hollow's Mill? What is stirring at Hollow's Mill? Nothing as yet or perhaps will be. But Moore is alone there. He has sent all the workmen he can trust to Stilborough. I am none of his well-wishers, sir. I don't care for him. So, Malone, you are afraid? You know me better than that. If I really thought there was a chance of a row, I would go. But Moore is a strange, shy man, whom I never pretend to understand, and for the sake of his sweet company only, I would not stir a step. But there is the chance of a row. You know Moore has resolved to have the new machinery, and he expects two wagon-loads of frames and shears from Stilborough this evening. Scott and a few picked men are gone to fetch them. It is unlikely that this night will pass quite tranquilly. They will bring them in safely and quietly enough, sir. Moore says so, and he affirms he wants nobody. But I call him very careless. He sits in the counting-house with the shutters unclosed. He goes out here and there after dark just as if he were the darling of the neighbourhood instead of its detestation. He takes no warning from the fate of Pearson, nor from that of Armitage, one shot in his own house, and the other on the moor. The evening was pitch dark. Star and moon were quenched in grey rain clouds. Malone tramped along the road, across the causeway, splish-splash through the mire-filled cart ruts. He looked for certain landmarks, the spire of Briarfield Church, Further on, the lights of Red House Inn. He thought longingly of a tumbler of whisky and water, and he would instantly have realised the dream. But there the company were Mr. Helston's own parish. They all knew him. He sighed and passed on, hurrying in seeming trepidation down a short lane, across an obscure yard, and towards a huge black mill. The work hours were over, the hands were gone, all was at rest, and the mill shut up. Malone walked round it. Somewhere in its great sooty flank, he found a chink of light. He knocked, using for the purpose the thick end of his shillelagh. A key turned, the door unclosed, and a voice said, 
Is that Joe Scott? What news of the wagons, Joe? No, said Malone. It is myself Mr. Hellstone would send me. Oh, Mr. Malone. There was a faint trace of disappointment in the voice, and then it continued politely, I beg you will come in, Mr. Malone. Malone followed the speaker into a light and bright room within. The boarded floor was carpetless, and except for the excellent fire and lamp on a table, it was a very plain place. Plain as it was, it seemed to satisfy Malone, who, when he had removed and hung up his wet surtout and hat, drew one of the rheumatic-looking chairs up to the hearth and set his knees almost within the red grate. "'Do you suppose that the putting up of this new machinery will bring you into danger?' inquired Malone, after a pause. "'I expected wagons at six. It is near nine now. I only wish the machines, the frames, were safe here within this mill. Once put up, I defy the frame-breakers. Let them only pay me a visit and take the consequences. My mill is my castle.' "'One despises such low scoundrels,' observed Malone. "'I almost wish a party would call upon you tonight.' "'but the road seems extremely quiet when I came along. "'I saw nothing astir. "'What these fellows have done to others, they may do to me. "'I should stand by my trade, my mill, and my machinery.' "'Malone whistled and looked impatiently around. "'Mr. Malone, you must require refreshment after your wet walk. "'I forget hospitality.' "'Not at all,' rejoined Malone. "'but he looked as if the right nail was at last hit on the head. "'It is my fancy to have every convenience "'and not to be dependent on the cottage yonder "'for every mouthful I eat or every drop I drink. "'I often spend the evening and sup here alone "'and sleep with Joe Scott in the mill. "'Mr. Malone, can you cook a mutton chop? "'Try me. "'I've done it hundreds of times at college.' "'The curate turned up his coat cuffs "'and applied himself to the cookery with vigour.' The manufacturer placed on the table plates, a loaf of bread, a black bottle, and two tumblers. He then produced a small copper kettle, filled it with water from a large stone jar in a corner, set it on the fire beside the hissing chops, got lemons, sugar, and a small punch bowl. The chops are done. Is the punch brewed? There is a glassful. Taste it. When Joe Scott and his minions return, they shall have a share of this provided they bring home the frames intact. Malone waxed very exultant over the supper. He laughed aloud at trifles. He made bad jokes and applauded them himself. His host, on the contrary, remained quiet as before. Moore, being what you would probably call at first view, rather a strange-looking man, for he is thin, dark, sallow, very foreign of aspect. He seems unconscious that his features are fine, that his eyes are large and grave and grey. He is still young, not more than thirty. His stature is tall, his figure slender. Robert Moore, indeed, was but half a Briton, and scarcely that. He came of a foreign ancestry by the mother's side, and was himself born and partially reared on foreign soil. Trade was Mr. Moore's hereditary calling— the Gerards of Antwerp had been wealthy merchants for two centuries back, but in the shock of the French Revolution, their business house had rushed down a total ruin. In its fall was involved the English and Yorkshire firm of Moore, closely connected with the Antwerp house. Some said that Robert aspired one day to rebuild the fallen house of Gerard and Moore on a scale at least equal to its former greatness.